Okay. We, um, I don't know what the stream delay is for Kurt to be able to see what's on the screen, so if you catch me describing what's on the screen, it's probably for Kurt, who can't see it for a second or 12 until the, uh, the stream catches up. It's all part of the magic of life. All right, everybody. The song that we were just playing was called Sticky Habits by Blue Topaz. You can find it by searching those words on Epidemic Sound. Sticky Habits, Blue Topaz. The one that's playing is Il Isla del Sol. Isla del Sol uh, by Henyeo. H-E-N-Y-A-O. This is some very indicting news. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome to our first live stream on YouTube in a few weeks. Really appreciate that you're all here. We're going to try to give you a, a professional show tonight. This is not going to be some partisan hackery of a political whatever. We're going to be... Um, we're going to be uh, trying to present to you the indictment, staying pretty much to the four corner corners of the indictment. And I think I gave us what, Kurt, permission for one, one degree. degree of freedom, yes. one degree of relevancy away from the thing. So no one's going to be calling the president names or anything like that. Uh, we're we're going to be sticking to the indictment and hoping that you can take from from things what you want to take from them. Uh, does that sound fair? We'll 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 we're not gonna promise to not be a little bit personally you know politically biased like i have my own personal political beliefs and and kurt has his i'm sure and we're not gonna try to shove them in your face but we're also not going to deny that they exist nor are we going to make this about our political beliefs either so I'm, we're not even going to go into that but you know if you are, if, if anyone's about to accuse us of political bias, that's really not what we're here about, though. Um, we're here to present what this indictment is and try to stick to it. And you can judge us. Let us know how we did. Think that's fair? Yeah, well, I, I know us well enough to know that we that our political biases are are different enough to, you know, make it, you know, make it interesting if we want to get into the politics. But I just prefer to stay to the law. So that's fine. Yeah, and the law, sometimes the law has a perspective, so it's completely okay to have a perspective that, that when something is, well, you'll see. Why don't we just jump into it, and you'll see what happens when two lawyers have opinions on things. What's, how's the joke go? What, is, what do you get if you ask 20 lawyers their opinion or something? If you ask two lawyers, you get three opinions. Something like that. I, I heard it as, like, if you ask 20 lawyers, you get 40 opinions or something. Yeah. It's, it's sort of like that. I, I, I do, I, and I, caught my, I catch myself doing it in my daily practice. When I talk to a client, I'll not just tell them what I would do. I'll tell them what they could do that I wouldn't do and explain why I wouldn't do it, but explain why they could do it if they wanted to and, you know, what the risks are. And I really haven't ever had anybody take those risks, but, you know, you want to fully inform everybody. Well, you know, like most, most professions, there is a bit of artistry in it. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of potential ways to do things that have their pluses and minuses. And so you have to find stylistic choices that work with you and make, make choices that, you know, reflect your personality. So, which is the fun part for me. <clears throat> Now that I've done that, Adobe has uncentered. So let me recenter Adobe. <laughs> yes. And as the chat has noted, we have two lawyers now with an opinion, two different opinions about what the opinions of lawyers are. So yes, it it has gotten <laughs> meta. <laughs> Very meta. It happens. So this is in the United States District Court for the District of Columbia. Wait. I'm getting ahead of us. We don't want to go into the indictment yet, right? We wanted to start first with this document. Grand jury indicts 12 Russian intelligence officers for hacking offenses related to the 2016 election. Now, who's telling you this? This is the Department of Justice. This is a press release from the Department of Justice. And this was presented today by Rod Rosenstein, who is the... 
acting director of the FBI? What is this? Who is he? Deputy AG, isn't he? Deputy AG. Right, right. Excuse me. Um, this, the indictment came from a grand jury. Yes, which is required in federal cases. Right? Okay. So all federal cases need a grand jury anyway. So this is not something where it necessarily came from one person, Robert Mueller. It's his indictments, but it's not necessarily where he just writes this and puts it out there. Nobody checks it. Right? It's, it's one step more than that. It's not much more than that. So grand juries, okay. grand juries are weird. They're, they're usually 20 people, and you don't need una, una, unanimity. It's a, it's a very low standard. It's just a... You know, there's the old saying that you can indict a ham sandwich. So you don't you don't need a lot okay. to get past a grand jury normally. Okay, so considering that is the standard for grand jury well. indictments, the Department of Justice today announced that a grand jury in the District of Columbia returned an indictment presented by Special Counsel Robert Mueller. <clears throat> I think I got that right. Yes, Mueller. The indictment charges 12 Russian nationals for committing federal crimes that were intended to interfere with the 2016 U.S. presidential election. All 12 defendants are members of the GRU, a Russian federal intelligence agency within the main intelligence directorate of the Russian military. These GRU officers, in their official capacities, engage in a sustained effort to hack into the computer networks of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, the Democratic National Committee, and the presidential campaign of Hillary Clinton, and released that information on the internet under the names DC Leaks and Guccifer 2.0 and through another entity. Oops, sorry. Mouse is a little sensitive. What is Guccifer 1.0? Internet... Is my first question. <clears throat> yeah. The Internet allows foreign adversaries to attack America in new and unexpected ways, said Deputy A.G. Rod Rosenstein. Together with our law enforcement partners, the De Department of Justice is resolute in its commitment to locate, identify, and seek to bring to justice anyone who interferes with American elections. Free and fair elections are hard fought and contentious, and there will always be adversaries who work to exacerbate domestic differences to try and confuse, divide, and conquer us. So long as we are united in our commitment to the shared values enshrined in the Constitution, they will not succeed. And it goes on to list the names, which we'll get to uh, when we get to the indictment. Um, the one unit... Well, you know what? How about we skip some of the details here, yeah. because we're going to read them in the indictment anyway. But I do, want it, I, I do want to get to the bottom here, because there are a few things that I just want to get out of the way real quick here. Um... There is no allegation in the indictment that any American was a knowing participant in the alleged unlawful activity or knew they were communicating with Russian intelligence officers. There is no allegation in the indictment that the charged conduct altered the vote count or changed the outcome of the 2016 election. Now, what do you think, what do you think that means, Blackleaf? What can we take from those two sentences? I... I, I, I... Or do you want me to answer first? No, I mean, I take note of the wording. It's very careful, right? The wording is very, it's very careful. careful. It's like, it's a, yeah, it's not here. It doesn't say it might not be anywhere else. So, it, yeah, it's just saying we haven't, we, haven't, we haven't alleged it in this document. Okay, great. But Yeah, that's, that was my takeaway from it as well uh, because I read the press release before. I didn't actually uh, read through the, the indictment yet, but I did read the press release, and when I got here, I was like, huh, no, that's, a, so, that's funny It's an wording. unbelievably weak statement, because you could say something like, there is no indication of, or there's no evidence right. of, or it's the current, just saying current investigation not has not here. suggested that. There's no allegation. It just simply says, we no didn't put it in the indictment. Alleg yeah. So that's, if we put that's, it in the indictment, we're going to tell you about the good tomorrow. book ending, but... But let's be clear, that's really weird language or, or weak language that they've used there. But they've bookended it and said this allegation's not about <coughs> accusing any American in particular of, of uh, whatever. I don't want to use the word. I'm not using the C word. Um, the... What, conspirator? <laughs> no, collusion. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. 
I just, I just, it's been such a, it's, it's like hashtag collusion okay. now, and it's like I'm like I'm not gonna even start with that game. Um, so what I'm looking at this and, and 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 saying is that it's just a weak statement, and it means you know this is not the the subject of this. <coughs> Uh, but also, there are also these other important statements. Everyone charged with a crime is presumed innocent until proven guilty. At trial, prosecutors must introduce credible evidence that is sufficient to prove each defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt to the unanimous satisfaction of a jury of 12 citizens. I'm not sure what, uh, they I'm cite, not sure what credible evidence's okay. weight is in this sentence. As like as opposed to what? I, I just don't understand why they say credible evidence. Is like as opposed to what? Why say it? I don't know. Incredible evidence. Come know. on, like that. The, the 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 more extra human, ultra human, the the prosecutor is, the more they can introduce incredible evidence. Yeah, literally incredible. As a as opposed, yeah. Well, literally incredible. This happens all the time. This case was investigated with the help of the FBI cyber teams in Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, San Francisco, and the National Security Division. The special counsel's investigation is ongoing. No comments from the special counsel at this time. Or probably any other time, so, to be quite honest, but okay. Yeah, well, he, see, yeah, he seems to just kind of, well, I'm not going to categorize it because we're going to stick away. We're going to stay away from that. So uh, let's go over to the actual indictment. There are, I think, 37 pages to get through. 20, no, 29. Oh. Hey, we got to read. Yeah, 29 is not too bad. <laughs> Only 29, and, and since it's 12 people, we're going to be repeating a lot of things. So I guess this is not maybe going to take hours to get through, but we'll see, I'll th however long it takes. So this is in the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia, filed today uh, with the clerk, all this other stuff up here. United States of America versus, and we're going to try this. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to go back and forth here. Uh, Black League, oh, I'll yeah. start. Victor Borisovich Netishko. Boris Eleskivich Antinov. <laughs> Dmitry Sergeyevich Bedin. Ian Sergeyevich Yermakov. <laughs> <laughs> Alexei Viktorovich Lukashev. Sergei Eleskovich Borkashev. Nikolai Yuryevich Kosachek. Pavel Yalashkovich Yersov. Artyom Andreevich Malishev. Ales Alexander Veliskimivich Orsilkuk. Alexei Alexandrovich Potemkin. Antovli Sergevich Kulavev. And I, and just everybody, we're having Leonard, fun Leonard with this, but I really don't mean... Leonard successfully proved that neither of us are Russian. Yeah, I really don't mean any disrespect to really any Russians, let alone these guys' names or persons' names. I don't actually know if they're all men. Um, I just We're just having fun with the names. Uh, this is an indictment. The grand jury for the District of Columbia charges count one, conspiracy to commit an offense against the United States. Sounds pretty generic. In or around 2016, the Russian Federation, Russia, operated a military intelligence agency called the Main Intelligence Directorate of the General Staff, the GRU. The GRU had multiple units, including units 26165 and 74455 engaged in cyber operations that involved the staged releases of documents stolen through computer intrusions. Intrusions. These units conducted large scale cyber operations to interfere with the 2016 U.S. presidential election. Defendants were GRU officers who knowingly and intentionally conspired with each other and with persons known and unknown to the grand jury, the conspirators, to gain unauthorized access or hack into the computers of U.S. persons and entities involved in the 2016 U.S. presidential election, steal documents from those computers, 
and stage releases of the stolen documents to interfere with the 2016 U.S. presidential election. Starting in at least March 2016, the conspirators used a variety of means to hack the email accounts of volunteers and employees of the U.S. presidential campaign of Hillary Clinton, the Clinton campaign, including the email account of the Clinton campaign's chairman. By in or around April 2016, the conspirators also hacked into the computer networks of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee and the Democratic National Committee. The conspirators covertly monitored the computers of dozens of DCCC and DNC employees, implanted hundreds of files containing malicious computer code or malware, and stole emails and other documents from the DCCC and DNC. Like, first of all, that's mind-blowing. Like, let me just stop there. We're at, pay at paragraph 5, and this is pretty mind-blowing. We, we, we knew... What do we know? We knew that, that there had been a release, right? We were all there for the release. We all saw that during the presidential campaign, right? Yeah. Black yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Any, I mean, any comments? Well, no, my, no? My, my, my only comment, and this is, I, I wonder the degree to which this is in any way sort of abnormal, either for this election or any election, because I would, I would imagine if I were guessing that, like, you know, Russia and Ch the U.S., are probably spying on each other about everything all the time. So I would sure. imagine that just like out of habit, they are breaking into the DCCC and the RCCC and every other campaign organization they can find for any kind of intelligence right. they can find on everything. So I'm not sure the degree to which any of this is really abnormal or unexpected. I, I have zero problem believing that our intelligence agencies are breaking into the equivalent on their side and probably breaking into the equivalent of the computers of France for no particular reason, except that's what intelligence <laughs> officials do. So it doesn't strike okay. me as odd. That's the number one thing. Okay. Still criminal. Yeah. Though. I mean, there's definitely, it's still definitely criminal. a problem. Like it's it's still saying. like an act, a criminal act against that nation's government. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it is. But, they're, you know, they're for against that. Nation. It's like, you know, the NSA and the, and the, and the cyber command, at Fort Meade, this is like their mission in life is to is to do foreign intelligence. That's like literally the charter of the NSA is it collect all the information from every computer in the world. And so I'm sure that we are in violation of many, many, many nations' laws, but that's kind of like what intelligence officials do. Okay. I mean, is this is this an abnormal reaction? No. No. Um I curious just i was just wanting to get your take on what you said versus you know that it's a criminal act that it would be totally normal for china to charge our officials if they did something or it would be totally normal for russia to charge our people in fact i think the bill browder story is a story about how russia is trying to say that bill browder did something and bill browder is trying to say no 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 russia did something so to the extent that they were just collecting information i don't find particularly odd to the extent they were actually interfering in our elections, I would be much more concerned. Okay, well, I mean, collecting information by monitoring employee employee computers and stealing their files and installing malware, that sounds that sounds criminal if, if it's done by a local person, you know, let alone by a foreign agent. Yeah, but uh, if, if what we're talking about in terms of malware is, for example, a keylogger, which would be malware, you know, again, yeah. I have very little trouble believing the NSA or the CIA is planning oh, this yeah. in computers all around the Heck, world. I think one of our one of the controversial discussions that we can have at some point is whether the NSA is is doing illegal things to American citizens, even. Yeah, that's a whole by monitoring their own communications. So, I, are you saying that no one should be surprised that this happens? Well, I, I'm 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 saying to the extent, or are you I, saying I, that it's weird that there's criminal charges? For I'm this saying thing that. This time? Well, that is a little odd, I think. But to, well, I I would I, I would find it. I don't find it troubling to the degree that they are actually interfering with the election. If it's just intelligence gathering, that doesn't bother me as much as if they're actually using it okay. to manipulate our elections. That would be a much bigger problem to me. Okay, well, let's continue. Paragraph 5. By, in, or around April 2016, the conspirators began to plan the release of materials stolen from the Clinton campaign, DCCC, and DNC. 
Beginning in or around June 2016, the conspirators staged and released tens of thousands of the stolen emails and documents. They did so using fictitious online personas, including DC Leaks and Guccifer 2.0. The, the conspirators also used the Guccifer 2.0 persona to release additional stolen documents through a website maintained by an organization. This is known as Organization 1. And I'm super curious who Organization 1 is. That had previously posted stolen documents from U.S. persons, entities, and the U.S. government. The conspirators continued their U.S. election interference operations through, in, or around November 2016. Let me finish this next paragraph and then we'll discuss. To hide their connections to Russia and the Russian government, the conspirators used false identities and made false statements about their identities. They, to avoid further detection, the conspirators used a network of computers located across the world, including in the United States, and paid for this infrastructure using cryptocurrency. I I need to stop here for a second, though, at paragraph 7. So, Organization 1. WikiLeaks, probably. Well, I was building Sorry. up to it. That had previously posted the stolen documents, or had previously posted stolen documents from U.S. persons, entities, and U.S. government. Yeah, who do we know that that could possibly be? What websites post... Is it LiveLeak that posts our dash cam videos? No, no, it's WikiLeaks that posts, you know, stolen documents from 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 Edward Snowden and etc. And then and then the other, you know, this damning allegation. I mean, I don't know about damning, damning, but just using the anonymity of cryptocurrency to be anonymous is exactly what you would expect spies to do. Yeah. Yeah, so far this just seems very spy versus spy-esque to me. Defendant Viktor Borisovich Netishko. I would love to be... I, I did learn Russian oh, so I can you read. Just pronounce it like it's English. It'll be even more hilarious. Was the Russian military officer in command of Unit 26165. They even give an address. It's, it's nice to know they have addresses, I guess. I that's It seems okay. <laughs> His unit had the primary uh, responsibility for hacking the DCCC and DNC, as well as the Clinton campaign. Uh, Boris Alexeyevich Antonov was a major in the Russian military assigned to Unit 26165, the email hacking uh, group. He oversaw the unit's dedication to targeting military political governmental, non-governmental organizations with spear phishing emails and other computer intrusion, intrusion, I can say this word, and other computer intrusion activity. Antonov held the title head of department. He supervised other co-conspirators who targeted the DCCC, etc. Uh, Dmitry Sergeyevich Baden was a Russian military officer in 26165, assistant head, Supervised co-conspirators. Yermakov was a military officer assigned to 26165. Yermakov used various online personas. Kate Milton, James McMorgans, Karen Millen to conduct hacking operations. He participated in hacking at least two email accounts from which campaign-related documents were released through DC leaks. In or around May of 2016, Yermakov also participated in hacking the DNC email server and stealing DNC emails that were later released through Organization 1. Defendant Alexei Viktori Viktorovich Lukashev was a senior lieutenant in 26165, used various online personas, Den Katenberg, Yuliana Martinova, sent spear phishing emails to members of the Clinton campaign and affiliated officials, including the chairman of the Clinton campaign. Sergei Alexandrovich Morgachev was a lieutenant colonel in 26165, used a hacking tool known as the X-Agent 
during the hacking of the DCCC and the DNC networks. He supervised the co-conspirators who developed and monitored the ex-agent malware implanted on the Can I read a couple of these? I would like to pronounce more Russian names poorly. Please, go for it. All right. Defendant Nikolov Yurkovich Kosevek was a lieutenant captain in the Russian military assigned to the Morjikev department within the unit 26165. Kosevek used a variety of monikers, including Kazakh and blah, blah, blah. One, two, three, four, five, six, five. That's hilarious. Kojevek developed custom and modern ex-agent malware to use to hack the DCCC and DNC networks beginning in and around April 2016. Defendant Pavlov Yekovets Yerzovov was a Russian military officer assigned to the Mojevek department within 26165. In and around 2016, Yervov assigned Kojevek and other co-conspirators in testing and customizing ex-agent malware before de- actual deployment and use. Defendant Atrium Adjavet Malzavev was the second lieutenant in the Russian military assigned to the Borjavev department within Unit 26-165. Malzavev used a variety of monikers, including, what is he, Django Magic Dev, and real Bouchard. Mm. In or around 2016, Maljevec monitored X agent malware and planted on the DCCC and DNC networks. Defendant Alexander Valkovich Orsichuk was a colonel in the Russian military, a commanding officer of 74455. Unit 7455 was located at a place. It assisted in the release of stolen documents through DC leaks and Guccifer. Promotion of those releases and publication anti clinton content on social media accounts operated by the GRU. Defendant Aleskev Alexander Pokebit, Pokebin was an officer of the Russian Pokemon. military assigned unit 74455. Pokemik was a supervisor of the department within 74455, responsible for the administration of computer infrastructure used in cyber <clears> operations. <throat> Infrastructure and social media accounts administered by Pokemon's department was used, among other things, to release the stolen documents through DC Leaks and Guccifer 2.0 personas. Okay, now wait a second. Here's uh, There's an important point here. Note that we changed from Unit 26165 over to 74455, and it looks like 74455 was the release of the stolen documents. Whereas 26165 was more of like a acquisition, 74455 was more of a dissemination unit. At least I mean, that's what I'm seeing here. Yep. Right? Object of the conspiracy. The object of the conspiracy was to hack into the computers of U.S. persons and entities involved in the 2016 U.S. presidential election, steal documents from those computers, and stage releases of the stolen documents to interfere with the 2016 U.S. presidential election. Antonov, Baden, Yermakov, and Lukashev and their co-conspirators targeted victims using a technique known as spear phishing to steal victims' passwords or otherwise gain access to their computers. Beginning by at least March of 2016, co-conspirators targeted over 300 individuals associated with the Clinton campaign, DCCC, and DNC. For example, on or about March 19, 2016, Lukashev and his co-conspirators created and sent a spear phishing email to the chairman of the Clinton campaign using the account John365GH at an online service that abbreviated lengthy website addresses referring to URL shortening services. Use the account to mask a link containing a spear phishing email which directed the recipient to a GRU website. Lukash have altered the appearance of the sender email address in order to make it look like the email was a security notification from Google, known as spoofing, instructing the user to change his password by clicking the link. These instructions were fo- the, those instructions were followed. On or about March 21st, 2016, Lukashev, Yermakov, and their co-conspirators stole the contents of the chairman's email account, which consisted of over 50,000 emails. <sighs> really? I mean, how mu- 
every day I'm telling my parents, make sure that you like hover over the thing and the actual like link says Google or bank or whatever. If you don't trust it, like call your bank and make sure they no. sent you the email. Look, before before I became a patent lawyer, I did a little bit of IT work, you know, in my undergrad days when I was interning because my background is computer science. And so when I was doing IT, uh, before I became a lawyer, I, there's no amount of training you can do for professionals. These are people that are college educated because I worked for banks, okay? There's no amount of training you can do that will prevent people from being completely stupid. It's unbelievable. I, 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 I'll tell you a story. When I was working for a bank that will go unnamed, I was in their IT department. And I was in their in their center IT infrastructure in their in their national headquarters. And one of my jobs was calling banks in our in our in our network and getting the people in the bank to do things at their location for me. So I would call them and say, Hi, my name is Kurt. I am from the network operations center of the national headquarters of so and so bank. And I need you to go onto your computer and do X, Y, Z. And in the three months I was interning, I never had one person challenge me. That's disturbing. <laughs> so I, I don't know what, what amount of training you can do that uh, is going to help people. So I, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I'll, I'll tell my, not a story again, but my summary of the, uh, what is it, clipboard or ladder. This is a real trick. I don't recommend you do it in like the illegal sense, but you know when you're when you can can you can get away with it legally, or you're not really harassing anyone, um, and you you know you're doing it for for good reasons or whatever. Try it sometime. Walk around with a clipboard or a ladder someplace that maybe you're all maybe you're. It's not illegal to be, but someplace you're not allowed to be. Can I can I say that? I'm not, sure. I'm not, I'm not trying to get anybody in trouble here. But I just mean like some place where you're, you know, maybe not supposed to be, but you're not, it's not illegal to be. You just, you want to go find out what something looks like or you, you know, carry a ladder, carry a clipboard. Almost no one will ever stop you. In fact, some people will even hold the door for you thinking that you're somebody important or that you've got a job to do. Now, the other half of this is you can't just carry a meek, you can't meekly carry the ladder. You've got to be confident. That's why they call them con men. They're confidence scams. And so you have the confidence to carry the ladder or clipboard as if you belong and you're supposed to be there. And if, and if you, you, know, you play your other cards right, you might be able to get someplace you're not supposed to be because you looked official. And this is more of a metaphor, but the actual thing of the clipboard or ladder works. A lot of times you can just walk into a place. Um, for instance, I was working on a construction site the past two days, and uh, I was actually very happy that the moment I walked in the building, someone stopped me and said, hey, can we help you? And I was like, oh, no, I'm with the company. And they were like, okay, we know the company. You're supposed to be here. So... I still had to sign in and out and everything, and I was very impressed that they actually had security. And and yes. to, to 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 take this example to another level, there was what was it was it called Stuxnet? Was the the famous virus that Stuxnet. was produced by an intelligence agency that was put on thumb drives and scattered around mm -hmm. in Iran, and the Iranians put it into their computer network, and it purpose and it was designed to destroy the centrifuges. And it was a very clever piece of computer code. And the way they did it, the way they, they got the penetration was by just putting it on thumb drives and just leaving the thumb drives around for people to find. And people put it inside their computers in nuclear yeah. facilities in Iran. He's not kidding. It's amazing. He's not even remotely kidding, by the way, everybody. This is a real thing. They left the virus on just rando USB keys at locations that they knew the nuclear engineers and stuff hang, hung out, and they just got picked up and stuck in computers, and enough of them got picked up and stuck in computers to get information that got them into the networks and, and got the, the malware onto the, yeah. the virus onto the systems. That was a real thing that happened. Social engineering... A, a a virus a viral attack. So so when it comes so to IT, that's a version. This is a version. When it comes of that. to IT, it is a weakest link problem, and there is no amount of security 
that will protect you against one of your users being a moron. <laughs> As as an IT person, I'm 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 really now searching like back in my head. Have I ever found a USB <coughs> stick and just been like, let's see what's on this? No, no, I've never done that. It's never even occurred to me to just like plug it in and see what's ha see what happens. Like, the worst I do is I'll get a new, supposedly excuse me, un you know empty. Uh, SD card or whatever, and I just don't care. Stick it right in my computer and and just start going. Assuming <coughs> that it's blank, you know. Assuming that the company that manufactured it or someone at the company that manufactured it didn't stick something on. Yeah. It probably could happen to me too that way. So maybe I shouldn't be too hard on on uh, the chairman here, who uh, who had their account hacked. Starting on or about March 19th, 2016, Lukashev, etc., spent sent spear phishing emails to the personal accounts of other individuals using John 365GH and caught victims one and two from hi.mymail at yandex.com, which he spoofed to appear to be from Google. So it was a, a, a URL shortened thing. On or about March 28th, 2016, Yermakov researched the names of victims one and two through their association with the Clinton campaign and vari on various social media sites. Through their operations, their, they and their co-conspirators successfully stole email credentials and thousands of emails from numerous individuals affiliated with the campaign. Many of these stolen emails, including those from victims one and two, were later released by the conspirators through DC leaks. On or about April 6th, the conspirators created an email account in the name of a known member of the Clinton campaign, but with one letter deviation. The conspirators then used that account to send spear phishing emails to the work accounts of 30 different Clinton campaign employees. In the spear phishing emails, Lukashev and his co-conspirators embedded a link purporting to direct the recipient to Hillary Clinton favorable rating dot XLSX. That in fact link that link in fact directed the recipient's computer. You know to everyone's falling for, for that trick. Website. You know they're all falling for that. Um well the reason why I got a little bit surprised there was that was round about the time when I was sitting in a when was well before I when was the the Bernie Sanders access to campaign information to the DNC campaign database revoked? Uh, somebody get me that date because I remember I was in the room with my local campaign when that happened and we were all kind of in a panic because of course like I'm sitting there like I don't know what to do I'm not part of it I, I'm just I'm just a campaigner like I'm supposed to go follow a sheet and go walk around and do my campaigning. And, um, and like Bernie's database access got pulled. I wonder if it wasn't from this hacking effort or whatever getting, cause I remember they thought that somebody from Bernie's camp had hacked into things. Wonder if it wasn't part of this. Mm. So I don't remember what the date was on there. If somebody can find the date, that would be interesting if that date lines up with any of these dates. 22. The conspirators spearfished individuals affiliated with the Clinton campaign throughout the summer of 2016. For example, on July 27th, the conspirators attempted after hours to spearfish for the first time email accounts at a domain hosted by a third party provider and used by Clinton's personal office, right? This would be the famous Clinton yep. emails. At or about the same time, they also targeted 76 email addresses at the domain for the Clinton campaign. Any comments, Blackleaf, before I continue? No, it looks pretty good. Beginning in or around March 2016, the conspirators, in addition to their spear phishing efforts, researched the DCCC and DNC computer networks to identify the technical specifications and, therefore, vulnerabilities. For example, Yermakov ran a technical query for DNC's IP protocol, or, uh, excuse me, IP configurations to identify connected devices. On or about the same day, Yermakov researched f searched for open source information about the DNC network 
the Democratic Party and Hillary Clinton. On or about April 7th, 2016, Yermakov ran a technical query for the DCCC's internet protocol configurations to identify connected devices. Mm. Okay, so that's just the same thing. Um, so he's looking for connected devices, looking for the, the infrastructure of the network for vulnerabilities. Uh, by, in, or around April 2016, within days of Yermakov's searches regarding the DCCC, the conspirators hacked into the DCCC computer network. Once they gained access, they installed and managed different types of malware to explore the DCCC network and steal data. On or about April 12, 2016, the conspirators used stolen credentials to access a DCCC network. I'm going to start I, skimming I think here. The, the conclusion here is that DCCC and RCCC probably just need to um, outsource their entire IT infrastructure to uh, yeah. IBM or Google or somebody who is trained and yeah. super professional in being able to deal with all these okay. problems. And let me let me let me here have a moment to reveal that I actually have a a small government, which what I would consider normally like a right wing or Republican kind of thing. I have a small government side, so it is with with a with a very heavy heart that I say that I would actually agree and think that there should be some kind of even regulation that says campaigns have to be conducted with some with some level of security beyond what this, you know, this shouldn't be so easy. Yeah. It's basically what I'm saying. Um, it, 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 there has to be some kind of IT security here. And I'm not even, I really just, I'm not the kind of person who likes to say government regulation, government regulation, government regulation. Not at all. Out of their own, but, self, uh, out of their own self-interest, they should be doing this. Self-interest? I want, I, there should be a regulation that our, our own country should be, should be trying to protect itself from freaking attacks during campaigns. I mean, come on. Isn't that theoretically why we have a cyber command? to do this but yeah yeah theoretically well that's probably getting starting to get too far removed from our Fair enough. Going one back to, degree of freedom yeah. i'm not accusing you i'm saying i would like to talk about it i'm saying i'm stopping myself because it's probably too far removed from our one degree of freedom rule okay where are we i'll read some Go ahead. I think we're on paragraph 24. Okay. And I was going to start to skim. So uh, I was reading that they stole credentials, one spear phishing email to employee one, entered a password after clicking the link. I mean, we're going to some of this is going to start to just be a little boring to go through yeah. if we repeat every single I'll allegation. So look, I'm gonna try, I was going to try to to I wasn't going to try and skip. I was just going to try and Fair skim. Enough. Skim a little bit. So B we're we're monitoring activity and stealing passwords. C, we implanted malware um, to log key logging. Uh, they leased a server in Arizona, GRU. The GRU leased a server in Arizona in C. Yeah. Uh, D, they repeatedly activated the key log to get passwords. Makes sense. Uh, 25. They had a server they were running as a middle server to act as a proxy, which is always a good idea. Um, all right, so now we're on to 26. The conspirators hacked to the DNC network through the DCCC, installed and managed different kinds of malware, part A, activated the key log, part B. They monitored the malware to see what, and get online banking information. That's, that's wonderful. They had gained access to approximately 33 DNC computers by June of 2016. Yep. So 27, um, conspirators hacked DNC to search for various terms. Cruise, for some reason. Okay. They copied DNC, DCCCs, including Benghazi investigations. Uh, <laughs> apparently the DCCC had a folder on their computer called Benghazi investigations, which makes sense. Uh, DCCC is what Democratic campaign? Yeah, Democratic uh, Congressional Campaign Committee. It's for the so congressional. Just office. super curious what why there was a Benghazi a question, investigations actually. folder on the DCCC. Why did DCCC would necessarily have that? But but you know, then again, if if somebody hacked my my like drives here on my local computer, there'd be like some a little bit of everything. Yeah, yeah. 
Like you'd find you'd find stuff that uh, like I don't mean illegal stuff. I just mean like it'd be like all over the place. Like obviously I'm not going to be terribly organized is what I'm trying to say. So you know the fact that they've got Benghazi investigations on DCCC computers might just be because you know somebody was involved and like just copied a folder over so they took it with them on a laptop. Probably. I'm not forgiving it. I'm just saying it's not very organized and that's normal. Uh, 28. We're using tools to gather compressed documents okay so they found they found seven zip and they zipped files that's great uh okay. part a they have a software called x tunnel i love these names x tunnel, x -tunnel to move the stolen to documents the... outside the dnc networks through encrypted channels yeah as opposed to not encrypted channels okay uh part b they steal additional information plain text. you could transmit it all through plain yeah i'm sure uh, they hacked their exchange server in 29, stole thousands of emails. And that's, like, wait a second. That's honestly where somebody like the NSA should be able to catch something and say, like, wait a second, we're seeing these plain text, you know, private emails all going through from some someplace in D.C. to someplace in Russia. No, of course you'd you encrypt know, it. I'm not of course saying you'd encrypt it. I mean, you'd run it off of DCN so you if you're being it. the laziest person ever. And it's just to encrypt the channel. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's not, we're not, this is not hard IT stuff here. No. But that's also not hard to defend against. Yeah. Uh, 29, they researched PowerShell commands relating to access to exchange. They ran some software in 30. They covered their tracks by deleting logs. Of course they did. All right, so now we're on to 32. You want to go back to summarizing? Sure. Despite the conspirators' efforts to hide their activity beginning in or about May 2016, both the DCCC and DNC became aware. They had been hacked and hired a security company, Company One, to identify the extent of the intrusions. Well, I'm really curious who Company One is. By and around June 2016, Company One took steps to exclude intruders from the networks. Despite these efforts, a Linux-based version of X-Agent programmed to communicate with the GRU-registered domain linuxkernel.net with no vowels in kernel remained on the dnc network until october of 2016. in response of comp to companies one's efforts the conspirators took countermeasures to maintain access yermakov searched for open source information about company one and its reporting on x agent next tunnel uh, the conspirators attempted to delete traces of their presence on the DCCC network using CCleaner. Isn't that like a... Yeah, I, I use it on my own computer. It's used to... Help me on or about... Space. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not condemning CCleaner. Yeah. I'm just saying like a, it's, that's it's, not it's, a... That's, among other things, X tunnel would be their malware, their malware, but CCleaner would be like somebody, like another yeah. tool. On or about June 14th, 2016, the conspirators registered the domain actblues.com, which mimicked the domain of a political fundraising platform that included a DCCC donations page. Shortly thereafter, the conspirators used stolen DCCC credentials to modify the DCCC website to redirect visitors to Act Blues. Nice. On or about June 20th, 2016, after Company One had disabled X-Agent on the DCCC network, the conspirators spent over seven hours unsuccessfully trying to connect to X-Agent. The conspirators also tried to access the DCCC network using previously stolen credentials. In or around September 2016, the conspirators also successfully gained access to the DNC computers hosted on a third-party cloud computing service. These computers contained test applications related to DNC analytics. After conducting reconnaissance, the conspirators gathered data by creating backups or snapshots of the DNC's cloud-based systems using the cloud provider's own technology. I'm going to guess this is like incremental backups from Dropbox yep. or something like that. The conspirators then moved the snapshots to cloud-based accounts they had registered with the same service, thereby stealing the data from the DNC. Clever. Clever. Use the existing technology. More than a month before the release of any documents, the conspirators constructed the online persona DC Leaks to release and publicize stolen election-related documents. On or about April 19th, 2016, after attempting to register electionleaks.com, the conspirators registered DC Leaks through a service that anonymized the registrant. 
The funds used to pay for the DC Leaks domain originated from an account at online cryptocurrency services that the conspirators had also used to fund the lease of a private server registered with the operational email account at durbinsabol at mail.com. The Durbin Sabol email account was also used to register the John 365GH URL shortening account used by Lukashev to spearfish the Clinton campaign chairman and other campaign related individuals. Wow. On or about June 8th, 2016, the conspirators launched the public website DC Leaks, which they used to release stolen emails before it shut down in or around March 2017. The site received over 1 million page views. The conspirators falsely claimed on the site that DC Leaks was started by a group of American hacktivists when in fact it was started by conspirators. Starting in or around June 2016 and continuing through the 2016 U.S. presidential election, the conspirators used DC Leaks to release emails that had been stolen. The conspirators released documents they had stolen, including those they had conducted in 2015, and emails collected from the Republican Party, from an individual affiliated with the Republican Party. On or about June 8th, 2016, at approximately the same time that DC Leaks was launched, the co-conspirators created a DC Leaks Facebook page using a pre-existing social media account under Alice Donovan. In addition to the DC Leaks Facebook page, the conspirators used other social media accounts in the names of fictitious U.S. persons such as Jason Scott, Richard Gingray. I think I remember the Richard Gingray one. To promote the DC Leaks website. The co-conspirators accessed those accounts from computers managed by Potemkin and his co-conspirators. On or about June 8th, 2016, the conspirators created the account on Twitter, DC Leaks, uh, DC Leaks underscore. The conspirators operated the DC Leaks underscore Twitter account from the same computer used for other efforts to interfere with the 2016 presidential election. For example, the conspirators used the same computer to operate the Twitter account Baltimore is WHR, through which they encouraged what, what are they saying about US Baltimore audiences. Now? I, I don't know. I'm not. I, th th there are no vowels in that last uh, word, so I don't know what word they could possibly uh, uh, be trying uh, yeah. to say. Uh, encouraged U.S. audiences to join our flash mob opposing Clinton and post images with the hashtag Blacks Against Hillary. Nice. I, I have so many questions about this Baltimore is WHR account. Why Baltimore? Why is that in particular? <laughs> what are they have against Baltimore? Yeah, I, I, I really don't know. why. Well, yeah, I, I mean, especially they could... I don't... Yeah, I... Mm -hmm. Baltimore was available. Maybe everybody else was I guess taken. Detroit is. WHR was not available. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, New York is. WHR. <sighs> Philadelphia is. Uh, it was all taken. Okay. On or about June 14th, 2016, the DNC, through Company One, publicly announced that it had been hacked by Russian government actors. Uh, in response, the conspirators created the online persona Guccifer 2.0 and falsely claimed to be a lone Romanian hacker to undermine the allegations of Russian responsibility for the intrusion. On or about June 15, 2016, the conspirators logged into a Moscow-based server used by and managed by Unit 704455 between 4.19 p.m. and 4.65... 65? Wow, dyslexic... 4.56 p.m. Moscow Standard Time and searched for certain words and phrases, including some hundreds seat sheets, some hundreds of sheets, DC leaks, Illuminati. I don't know if that means widely known translation or if it's like we're not going to tell you what that is because there is a widely known translation. So somebody can look that up for us. Uh, worldwide known, think twice about or company's competence. Now, here's an interesting question. Why are they being so precise? about the time in part 41 because up to this point we haven't been this precise now now we're getting down to like these these yeah. precise windows why like that could just be some posturing like someone saying look we know something happened because we know the times that it happened or they're saying when some other allegation comes along remember this time this window here you've got this window of of 37 minutes 
going on here. Yeah, it just strikes. And then maybe those thirty-seven minutes will be important, to, and to a certain person will have to point, be at a certain time. Up to this point, we haven't been this kind of precise. So when you start changing it, and now we're like, oh, we're mentioning it this precisely. That's got to be a signal of some kind to somebody. It means somebody, something to somebody. So that's Later that problem. day at 7.02 p.m. Moscow Standard Time, the online persona Guzifer 2.0 published its first post on a blog site created through WordPress titled DNC Service Hacked by Lone Hacker. The post used numerous English words and phrases that the conspirators had searched for earlier that day. Worldwide known cybersecurity company announced that Democratic National Committee servers had been hacked by sophisticated hacker groups. Some hundred sheets, that's a serious case, isn't it? I guess company one customers should think twice about that company's competence. The Illuminati and, oh, F the Illuminati and their conspiracies, F company. Apparently, one. Russian spies think Illuminati is a thing, so that's okay. <laughs> So this was this was a really interesting. Why, so they searched for these terms and then used these terms later in this misle intentionally misleading email. Um, it's another good word for intentionally misleading. Catfishing is that catfishing? It's a type of intentionally misleading. Sure. Between in or around June 2016 and October 2016, the conspirators used Guccifer 2.0 to release documents through WordPress that they had stolen from DCCC and DNC. The, co the conspirators posing as Guccifer 2.0 also shared stolen documents with certain individuals. On August 15th, 2016... The conspirators received a request for stolen documents from a candidate for the U.S. Congress. Well, yeah, remember how they said earlier in the press statement, we aren't mentioning any U.S. citizens in this indictment? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The conspirators responded using the Guccifer 2.0 persona, or Guccifer, Guccifer? Is that what it is? Gucci? It's supposed to be Gucci? I, whatever. I don't know. And sent the candidate stolen documents related to the candidate's opponent. So they... Re wait. Just mind blown here for a second. August 15th... I'm going to have to go back and look at this timeline. There's a request from a candidate for U.S. Congress... For op research. Yeah. Which they apparently sent. Which they then sent and gave, and the candidate got on their opponent. Okay. On or about August twenty second, twenty sixteen, the conspirators posing as Guccifer, I'll, I'll just use start saying it that way, Guccifer two point transferred approximately two point five gigs of data stolen from the DCCC to a then registered state lobbyist and online source of political news. The stolen data included donor records and personal identifying information for more than 2,000 Democratic donors. Nice. On or about August 22, 2016, the conspirators posing as Gucci for 2.0 sent a reporter stolen documents pertaining to the Black Lives Matter movement. The reporter responded by discussing when to release the documents and offering to write an article about their release. All right, looks like 44 It's going to get interesting now. You want to go Sure. Forward? The conspirators posing as Guccifer 2.0 also communicate with U.S. persons about the release of stolen documents. On or about August 15th, conspirators posing as Guccifer wrote to a person who was in regular contact with senior members of the presidential campaign of Donald J. Trump. Quote, thank you for writing back. Do you find anything interesting in the docs I posted on? Quote, on or about August 17th, 2016, the conspirators added, quote, please tell me if I can help you anyhow. It'd be a great pleasure to me, unquote. On or about September 16th, 2016, the conspirators, again posing a goose for 2.0, referred to a stolen DCCC document posted online. And a person, what do you think of the info on the turnout model for Democrats' entire presidential campaign? The person said, pretty standard. The conspirators conducted operations in Goose for 2.0 in DC leaks using overlapping countries computer infrastructure and financing, 
for example. Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm not going to let you get past paragraph 44 without going back. All right, back you want to stop 44? Sure. No, I mean, it's pretty, pretty big stuff. I mean, you got... A so there is some contact. kind of communication you know, with U.S. persons about the release of stolen documents. Wrote to a person who was in regular contact with senior members of the presidential campaign of Trump. Yep. And that person wrote back. And apparently more than once. I'm super interested in who that person is. Go ahead. All right, 45. The conspirators conducted operations using overlapping computer infrastructure. Conspirators used the same pool of Bitcoin funds to purchase a VPN account and lease server in Malaysia. They use the server to host the DC links, use VPN to log on to a Gus for two account. The, the conspirators opened the VPN account from the same server. On or about June 27th, they contacted a U.S. reporter with an offer to provide stolen emails from Hillary Clinton's staff. The conspirators then sent a reporter a password to access a non-public password-protected access, and the conspirators in around 2016. The conspirators published a statement on a WordPress blog falsely claiming the intrusion Lisa the stolen documents had totally no relation to the Russian government. That's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Don't look over here, no guys. No scroll for you. No Russian government in, at all. Yeah, go go look up the concept of psychological projection. The more the more that somebody says something, like when it starts to be like, why does that guy always say that? It's possibly psychological projection. Yeah. Uh, good times. Forty-seven. Or to expand their inference interference. Sorry, in the election, the conspirators transferred made the documents they stole the DNC and chairman of the Clinton campaign to Organization One. Conspirators discussed the release of stolen documents and timing to heighten their impact on the election. The organization sent a message to Gisford to send any new material stolen from the DNC here for us to review and have a much higher impact on what you're doing. Organization One had asked, if you have anything Hillary-related, we want in the next cube days, preferably because the DNC is approaching and she will solidify Bernie Sapphire's behind her after Conspirator said, okay, I see. Organization One said, we think Trump has only a 25% chance of winning against Hillary. So the conflict between Bernie and Hillary is interesting. I'm sure you, as a Bernie supporter, find that oh so reassuring. Yeah, we, well, I think we had already learned from a couple, from two books and a bunch of conspiracy theories that there was definitely some kind of favoritism going on in the DNC. <coughs> where Hillary was more or less either expected to or wanted to or somebody wanted her to win. I mean, I'm not, there lots of people who wanted her to win, but I mean, in this case, somebody wanted her to win so badly that they, yeah. they, 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 they tainted the process. Uh, Again, I'm not going to try to say more than that. I'm carefully choosing my words, but they tampered with the process and made it, made it seem like, there was some favoritism going on to Bernie, and, and now we're more or less confirming that there was some favoritism going on against Bernie um, and in favor of Hillary, yeah. which I'm would, both were both were. No, I'm not going to go there. I'm going to not. Nope. Nope. <laughs> we're going to stay away from we're going to stay away from the political discussion. It's tough. It is tough to stay away from the political discussion. But we will press on. Where are we? Are you? Were you on? Uh, 48. Organization One released 20,000 emails and other documents stolen. The release... Did you wait? No, you know, you hadn't read BB yet. After failed attempts to transfer the stolen documents in late June 2016. Yeah, the yeah. conspirators posted or July 14th. With attachment that contained information how to access. Okay. Then they released 20,000 okay. emails and other documents stolen. The release occurred three days before the start of the DNC convention. Nice. Organization did not disclose Gusfer's role providing them. Last, the latest in time email released through organization was May 25th, approximately the same day conspirators hacked into the DNC. Um, on August the 7th, 2016, Organization One released the first set of emails from the chairman of the Clinton campaign that had been stolen. Between October the 7th and November the 7th, Organization One released approximately 33 tranches 
Haven't seen that word outside the financial context. The heck is a trunch? It just means slice. It just means a fraction. Oh, 33 releases. Yeah, it's, okay. it's just a fancy word for slice. But okay. I haven't seen that word outside of financial context. Anyways, 33 tranches of documents that have been stolen from the chairman of the Clinton campaign. In total, over 50,000 stolen documents were released. And then they are getting to the statutory allegations. Okay. Well, I'm going to try to skim through these quickly. Um, to knowingly access a computer without authorization, etc. To cause the transmission of a program, information code, or command, etc. Yep. Um, and then there are additional counts. And I just want to make sure there's nothing else terribly interesting that we're skipping. Um, and then it accuses everybody of knowingly transferring, <coughs> possessing, using without lawful authority a means of identification of another person in relation to a felony. Then it accuses them of laundering money to facilitate the purchase of infrastructure and that was used in the hacking activity. Defendants conspired to launder the equivalent of more than $95,000 through a web of transactions structured to capitalize on the perceived anonymity of cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin. Although the conspirators caused transactions to be conducted in a variety of currencies, they principally used Bitcoin when purchasing servers, registering domains, and making payments in furtherance of hacking activity. Many of these payments were processed by companies located in the United States that provided payment processing services to hosting companies, domain registrars, and other vendors, both international and domestic. The use of Bitcoin allowed the conspirators to avoid direct relationships with traditional financial institutions, allowing them to evade greater scrutiny of their identities and sources of funds. All Bitcoin transactions are added to a public ledger called the blockchain, but the blockchain identifies the parties to each transaction only by alphanumeric identifiers known as Bitcoin addresses. To further avoid creating a centralized paper trail of all of their purchases, the, co the conspirators purchased infrastructure using hundreds of different email accounts, in some cases using a new account for each purchase. The conspirators used fictitious names and addresses in order to obscure their identities and their links to Russia and the Russian government. For example, the DC Links domain was registered and paid for using the fictitious name Carrie Fian and an address in New York. In some cases, as part of the payment process, the conspirators provided vendors with nonsensical addresses. Yeah. The conspirators used several dedicated email accounts to track basic Bitcoin transaction information and facilitate Bitcoin payments to vendors. GFADE147 was one of them, which received hundreds of Bitcoin payment requests and approximately uh, from, from uh, about 100 different email accounts. Please send exactly 0 0.026043 Bitcoin to a certain 34-bit character Bitcoin address. Shortly thereafter, the transaction matching those exact instructions was added to the blockchain. On occasion, the conspirators facilitated Bitcoin payments through the same computers they used to conduct their hacking activities, including to create and send and test uh, to send test spear phishing emails. Additionally, one of these dedicated accounts was used by the conspirators in or around 2015 to renew the registration of a domain, the linuxkernel.net address, encoded in certain ex-agent malware installed in the DNC network. The conspirators funded the purchase of computer infrastructure by mining Bitcoin, in part. Okay. Individuals and entities can mine Bitcoin, yeah. etc., Bitcoin mining that was then operation. used to register DC leaks. There's a yeah. Then there's how Bitcoin works. So down to sixty five. Um, conspiracy to transport, transmit money, and transfer money instruments through the United States. So basically wire fraud. Um, Eleven conspiracy and sixty six. So yeah. So basically, we're we're charging them with unauthorized computer access wire fraud and uh, basically those related crimes, conspiracy. Uh, defendants Osadchuk and Kovalev were GRU officers who knowingly and intentionally conspired with others 
to hack into the computers of U.S. persons and entities responsible for the administration of the 2016 elections, such as state boards of elections, secretary of state, and U.S. companies that supplied software to other technology and related administration of U.S. elections. So that's a new one, too. That's saying that they attempted to hack U.S. elections, state boards of elections, secretaries of state, and U.S. companies that supply software, so mm -hmm. like voting machine companies like Diebold, or whatever, they're NCR now. Yeah. New California Republic, for any Fallout fans. Can't go to a Diebold machine and see the NCR logo and not think about Fallout. <coughs> Also about how crappy Diebold security is. It is somewhat amazing. Yeah. There's a um, there's a there's a go go look up how horrible the security on Diebold machines is. Yeah. Maybe it's better now. I don't want to completely defame them, but um, it didn't used to be. Let's see what else. <clears throat> The object of the conspiracy was to hack into protected computers of persons and entities charged with the administration of the 2016 U.S. elections in order to access those computers and steal voter data and other information stored on those computers. In or around June 2016, Kovalev and his co-conspirators researched domains used by U.S. state boards of elections, secretaries of state, and other election-related entities for website vulnerabilities. Kovalev and his co-conspirators searched for state political party email addresses, including filtered queries for email addresses listed on state Republican Party websites. Yeah. In or around July 2016, Kovalev and his co-conspirators hacked the website of a state board of election and stole information related, related to approximately 500,000 voters, including names, addresses, partial social security numbers, dates of birth, driver's license numbers. In or around August of 2016, Kovalev and his co-conspirators hacked into the computers of U.S. Vendor is it, 1. Is it too political a comment to say that we really need to do more election security? Because, I, you know, it's just, it's just no, too disturbing that we have... That we have all these these companies with proprietary software that are running so many voting machines, and we don't know what the code is, and we don't know how to secure it. It's like it's just really yeah. troubling to me. And I, you know, we need to do more to do to have election security. So they hacked into vendor one that supplies software used to verify voter registration. The FBI issued an alert about the hacking of Vendor 1 and identified some of the infrastructure that was used to conduct the hacking. In response, Kovalev deleted his search history. Kovalev and his co-conspirators also deleted records from accounts used in their operations targeting state boards of elections and similar election-related entities. In or around October 2016, they further targeted state and county offices responsible for administering 2016 elections. For example, October 28th, Kovalev and his co-conspirators visited the websites of certain counties in Georgia, Iowa, Florida to identify vulnerabilities. In November 2016 and prior to the election, Kovalev and his co-conspirators used an email account designed to look like a Vendor 1 email address to send over 100 spear phishing emails to organizations and personnel involved in administrating elections in numerous Florida counties. The spear phishing emails contained malware that conspirators embedded into Word documents bearing Vendor 1's logo. Between June 2016 and November 2016, Osichuk and Kovalev knowingly and intentionally conspired to commit access violations, transmission of programs, etc., in violation of U.S. law. Yep. And then this is what this is a pretty standard thing. A forfeiture allegation is what that yeah, just criminal process proceeds. We, we 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 want all your assets. We're gonna take everything that's that's yeah. part of this. Yeah, eighty. If we can't get that, we want other stuff. And then signed by uh, my brethren. Mr. Mueller. Yep. There he is. Robert S. Mueller III, Special Counsel, U.S. Department of Justice. So my overall thoughts here are several fold. I think, as I was saying up at the top, I, I, I have very little difficulty believing that this sort of spying is just kind of standard. This is like what spies do. So... 
I, you know, I have very little difficulty believing that the NSA and how many agencies are within the intelligence community? I have trouble keeping track. So 13, because there's a lot of them. And a lot of them names you probably wouldn't know off the top of your head. Um, but NSA, CIA, and FBI to some degree, and the people who deal with the satellites, uh, geo, geospatial. Um, I mean, we got a lot of intelligence agencies spending a lot of money to, and they're 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 doing the same thing. We I have no trouble believing that our people are hacking into their computers, looking for the same kind of information, just as standard intelligence gathering operations. So, to some degree, this just feels a little bit normal. The part that seems abnormal is the part where they're leaking it out to influence the election. That's the abnormal part, and that's the part that you know as a you know, a person interested in protecting my country as a citizen, that's the part that, you know, I get really irritated with because it's like, well, we're we're a sovereign country and you're interfering with the right of the people collectively to exercise their sovereign will and exercising yeah. who should be their leaders. And that's arguably active war type territory when you are as a government, if you're a foreign government, interfering in the essential governmental process of another government. It's like, that's when you start thinking about active war territory. That's just, be, that's beyond spying. So that's, that's where I get really rankled up. Yep. Yeah, me too. I mean, I, I can't say through this whole thing that I've really trusted any Russian authority. And it bothers me when people speak like, We've always trusted our friends, the Russians. No, there was like a Cold War, and like we haven't been friends. Uh, we we've, we tried. I think I think we've definitely tried several times. Uh, I'm not sure that we're that we're currently really good friends with Russia. Yeah. I don't I don't know. If that's a really good thing to try and do right now. Right. But you know that's getting dangerously close to a, a larger political discussion. Yeah, and uh, getting away from. This I tonight. noted here in the chat. I want to try to. Be a little bit clear about this because this goes to something you said in an earlier video about trying to be nuanced and trying to express a nuanced point. Because Valen, Valen was saying, try and stop trying to frame this as routine. Let's try. I want to be clear about what I'm trying to say is or and is not routine. Because I'm trying to make a more nuanced point. I think it's routine for countries to spy on other countries. I think it's routine for countries to hack into computers and gather intelligence information. I don't think it's routine for the for candidates uh, or campaigns of one organization to conspire with or collude with or or otherwise act as unwilling or willing foreign agents with another power. So I'm trying to be a little bit more nuanced about what I say is or is not routine. So when they're hacking into other computers, this is normal. When they're saying what's happening is there's collusion, there's dumping of information, there is that kind of activity. So I'm like, that's not normal. So, anyways, for what it's worth, I was trying to make a more nuanced point. Yeah, I, no, I think your point's valid. I didn't, I wasn't, when I was challenging you before, I saw Valen's comment as well. When I was challenging you before, I just, I was challenging you to, to try to get to that identity of where exactly you're, what you were trying, you were trying to say there. Um, and it did, to me, sound like you were saying that it's, it's more like uh, routine for the spying to happen. It's not routine for the interference to happen. Right, that's the part that really bothers or, me. At least... E that's what I was saying. E even, even if it is routine, that is like some truly subversive stuff. That's... I mean, that, that, that's... I'll, I'll say it out loud, but I'm not going to discuss it in like the long sense. But that's trying... That, that, that's, that's really supporting the theory in my mind that... that, that someone you know whether it's putin or you know, officials in russia or whatever unable to to raise themselves up are trying to knock us down but that's that's dangerously close to a political statement there so i really don't want to go any further than that right but it does sound an awful lot like a, an attempt to sabotage america in a broader sense not just mess up an election but to actually mess up america no yeah when you're get, when you're going to the heart of what it means which in our country, we're government of we the people. This is our foundational principle. The people and their collective will are sovereign. And the people exercise their sovereignty through elections where we elect representatives. So when you are, as a foreign government, doing things that, that directly impact 
the voters in the terms of their exercise of their will, then you're interfering with what it means to be America. That's where it gets really bothersome. So when they're when they're dumping information for the purpose of interfering with the election, when they're co colluding or providing information for the purpose of interfering with the election, when they're doing that kind of stuff, that's where I get really rankled up. And that's like where I start thinking, oh, this isn't just criminal. This is now like international crisis kind of problems. It's like we're past criminal yeah. at that point. Yeah. So I, I I think I'll stop there. With there's supposed to be some kind of meeting with Putin and Trump on Monday. That's worth mentioning because this the timing of this can't possibly be a coincidence. Yeah, right? we, we I found that find the timing a little odd. You know, because there's no particular now, reason. Wait, Mueller Mueller often ind indicts on Fridays. Like that's Mueller, it's known Fridays is is Mueller indictment Friday. Yeah, but there's no there was no particular reason for him to file this indictment today as opposed to you know a month from now next friday or a friday yeah ago. so it's like it's a little odd in to me because he's a smart guy he's well aware of the fact that they're meeting he's well fair well the the the, the diplomatic implications of that so it is slightly odd and i i would be surprised if that didn't pass into his calculation a little bit yeah I, I, now, I don't know if that's unethical or illegal or anything. I just, uh, the timing is worth noting. There's something, there could potentially be something meaningful in there. Whether, you know, I don't mean meaningful in good or bad way. I just mean something more than, than no meaning. Yeah. And, and, and the, the, I still am back to the one paragraph where they got really, really precise on the times. It's like, oh, it's between this half hour window. 419 and 456. It's like yeah. someone somewhere had their eyebrow raised because of that sentence. It's like, oh shit, they knew where I was yeah, that time. <laughs> that, that sentence was there for... That a, was me. It seems for a reason. Because it, it stands out to me. Yeah, that's a little bit... They could they could have said you know, bef between 4 and 5 p.m. Uh, just for brevity, for clarity and brevity. But they specifically gave the exact time. Yeah. There's something going on there. I don't know whether or not this will have All any right. impact on the diplomatic exchange between Trump and Putin. I somehow doubt it, but it does seem slightly I, out on the I'm timing. I'm curious to see mostly if it'll have an impact on the conversation between uh, opposing sides in, in this country, because I'm my my main my main terrible concern. The most political thing I'll say tonight is actually I'm trying to be constructive here is that I think we're not talking to one another. You and I, like, like Kurt and I have differing views, but you and I can talk to one another. And I think that this is actually rare. I think that there's actually a lot of people out there who can't talk to their parents or their, the people who aren't their friends or their normal circle of friends or the people who don't normally agree with their political views. This, we don't, either don't have the skill or don't have the time or don't have the attention or don't care or are not smart enough or aren't trained in how to do it or something. We are not talking to one another about our issues and instead are just shouting at one another from across uh you know a blocked off street during a protest yeah and i i think i think every i think people from all political points have have value and they have something to say and you can't effectively under you can't effectively understand your own side if you can't understand the opponent's side this is one thing i really liked when i was doing formal debate in high school and college, which incidentally, I really miss structured formal debate. I, I miss that um, because what was really nice about structured formal debate, at least the kind that I did, is that you didn't, you literally didn't know what side of the issue you were going to be on. You knew what the issue right. was, but yep. you know, I did mock trial moot court and I did like Lincoln Douglas and I did policy debate. So you're like knew what the issue was going to be like resolved. The United States should uh, increase its it's space-based funding. And you didn't know what issue it's going to be. You didn't know what side you're going to be. So you had to literally be able to argue either side. Yeah. And same thing with mock trial. It's like you, you know what the issue is and you know what the law is, but you have to be prepared to argue it either way. And yeah. I really like that. And one of the things that that taught me is I, I feel like I have the ability to listen to someone who is liberal and someone who is conservative and to understand their view and be able to it's like if i can't argue your perspective better than you can it's like i don't really understand my own perspective is sort of my philosophy 
So that's why I, that's what I aim to. For what it's worth. So I just posted the Discord invite link to our uh, politics and religion channel. Um, I'm not going to vouch for how good or bad the conversations are in that channel, but uh, it's the channel on our Discord, on the Lawful Masses Discord, and uh, you're certainly welcome to... Um... Oh, I just took you off the I, I noticed Black. that. Yes, Sorry. my face was replaced by Discord. I did take that. <laughs> That's what happens. When I try to grab the link. Yeah, phage, so, phage um, lies. I couldn't you're, you're back. You should be it's back too now. too bad yes. that mock debates yes, are not a thing past high school. You know, as as lawyers, you get a little bit like that, but I I miss formal debate so much. It's one of my favorite things of yeah. all time. Well, we I, I had an idea to bring it back here. Um, I thought that we could have like a scheduled either once a month, like formal debate where starting maybe you and I or, or whatever, but we would have guest debaters too and maybe even someone would be called the master debater at some point i mean it just has to be that award. yes you know of course every debater has made that joke three billion times but we can make it some more. <laughs> hey for an entirely new generation i'm older now there's an entirely new generation of people who have not heard our bad jokes yet yeah that's that's great so we can we can go but i that. i'll say to all the people out there in the chat if if you consider yourself either you know, Republican or Democrat, if you consider yourself either liberal or conservative, you might do yourself a small service in attempting to understand the op op opposing view of the thing that you believe in most. So take the take the political thing or political things, maybe two or three issues that you believe in the most, that you're the strongest on, and do yourself the favor of trying to understand why the opposing side believes what they believe. And while you're doing that, then you can also try and understand why those of us in the middle, every time we say anything at all, we get shouted out by both yes, sides. Right. <laughs> so it's just so much more fun to try and, and go straight down the middle because I just love have, you know, saying like, oh, I like guns. I also like Medicare. Oh, great. Now I've got both sides out against me. You know, <laughs> you know? It's, it's funny because it's like, you know, uh, you know, I have views on, on both sides of the spectrum. It's like, uh, it's like, but it's like, oh, I like guns. And I also believe that the environment is a good thing and we should do more to protect it. And that would be nice. So oh, yeah. it's like, oh, apparently this is a problem for some reason. So back to the debate, the the, the pros of debate. My, um, my most favorite experience uh, with debating was actually in law school, but it was when I was doing an international like study abroad kind of thing. And the, we were, we, what we were studying European copyright and other intellectual property law, but it turned that there was a whole section on European trade. And then there was a whole section on European environmental law. And so everybody's, you know, a big environmentalist because, you know, it's a pretty easy thing to get behind, especially for younger people. We're going to be here a while, we hope. And, um, and so everybody wanted to debate for <laughs> environmental protections. And so the, the, the professor had to make an incentive and was like, if any one of you will simply debate against EU environmental protection law, um, you don't have to take the final exam. So I was like, sure. I raised my head instantly. <laughs> and it was actually one of the weirder things because I had not debated sem something that was so gray. I usually, usually there's pretty easy positions to take. I, I you know, in an environmental debate, the, the, the debate was not yes environment or no environment. The debate was much more subtle than that. It was how would you use these regulations or how would you try to oppose these regulations in using EU environmental law and your understanding and how would you argue before the whatever commission this was seven years ago I, I don't remember all of it but um i ended up just sort of making it up not in the light sense i mean in the lawyer sense i mean i did my research and i just sort of like okay well this is the best argument i can make i didn't feel very good about it but then again i also had no barometer because i had never argued anything like that before so i just went up there and i said you know okay well i you know 
only thing I see is, and I, I try to say it more confidently than this, but like, only thing I see is like, you know, this regulation says forests and this isn't classified as forest region. And this regulation over here says whatever. And it's not that, you know, that's out. It's not also not the right definition. And then I just went through the things as best as I could. And I really felt like I was doing a horrible job and I got an A minus. Yeah. So. Yeah. The, the, the best debates are, are like that where you're on, on, on a weird side of the issue. I remember one debate yeah. like that where where I was in high school debate, and the issue was literally uh, it was more Congress, as like sh essentially someone had a bill to uh, to enhance the penalties for child abuse, and of course there's like eight pro speeches in a row, and so at one point I'm like okay, so I got up and I give a con speech. I'm like we need more child <laughs> abuse. So I just give this con speech and everyone loved it you know i did i did a really good job with it just because it was yeah. but it's like you remember those kinds of things it's like where you're pushing your well, pushing yourself to figure out how to make these interesting yeah. arguments and 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 to touch on a subtle point that you might may or may not have made there but you first said you know child abuse versus you know no child abuse versus more child abuse that's not necessarily the way the debate could have been framed it could have been like you said, child abuse regulation, or, you know, not more child abuse regulation. And and that's, that's, there are some very good arguments that are going on. Yeah, that on. wasn't the way I went with um, it. I decided to go for broke, as long as I'm going to give a cause. You, you, went, you went, yeah, you went satirical yeah. with it. And uh, we were going to start eating babies, yeah, I think. Like what that. was that? Uh, a modest proposal? Is that what that was yeah, called? Yeah, something like that, yeah, so... <laughs> Um, and, and so let's take that debate just one step further. Somebody called me Leonard Big Oil French as a joke. That's funny. Uh, Sigvard, I really like that. Uh, and that takes me to um, the whole fracking thing was going on in Pennsylvania a few years ago. And there was Josh Fox and, and, and his documentaries trying to get rid of all the fracking. And I, I, I'm, we actually presented it at law school. And I met Josh Fox twice. And interesting documentaries and i you know now years later i'm willing to reveal what i really thought during that time not that any of you were around because i wasn't around here uh but the documentary was all about how horrible fracking was and it made all these wonderful points about how horrible fracking was but like i watched the documentary and i took a completely different takeaway yeah. than what i think the intention of the documentary was because i noticed something the people in the documentary who were having problems with fracking weren't actually having problems with fracking. It seemed like they were having problems with fracking that wasn't done properly. Yep. It seemed like they were having problems with, and I'm not, I'm not condo endorsing fracking either. I, I actually don't necessarily agree with the initial way that practice was done, but it was the sort of like unregulated, unchecked nature of it that either they didn't drill the wells properly or they didn't dispose of the chemicals properly because it can be thousands of dollars to dispose of some of those chemicals. You just go over to the stream and dump it in the stream and hey, I got $5,000 to take my kids on vacation. Yep. You know, not a, not a very difficult decision for certain kinds of people. Um, I think there's problems with fracking in other ways but that's for like a complete debate but what i'm trying to say is that there's is that it's important to have these debates to get to these nitty-gritty details that make a difference because it wasn't in josh fox's documentary like it was presented that that all fracking was automatically fracking horrible yeah. but rather that improperly done fracking was horrible and that needed to be a little bit more clear in in the opposition video you know the anti-fracking video needed to make that a little more clear i think they had a responsibility to do that not condemning josh fox or anything he brought a lot of uh uh awareness too but some of that awareness was misinformation is what i'm trying to say and that's why it's important no matter what your political beliefs are on both sides let's find out the truth and then let's debate about how we should best react to the truth yeah. big government small government pro-choice, pro-life, those are all debates that we can have if we at least agree to have them. And in order to agree to have them, that means we have to start identifying some common ground that we can have those disagreements uh, on. Yeah, exactly. You know, the, the, these issues, Soapbox. even if you come out one way or the other, you know, these issues rely on a chain of reasoning. <laughs> and it's like you can you can look at the chain of reasoning and try to honestly assess why that's so and 
that's one thing I was grateful for for law, law school is that it really teaches you how to think like that and how to really open thinking. Yeah. I think that's one of the valuable things. Yeah, more than just the law, the, the it, it taught me that there's a lot of different ways to think about things. So, yeah. Final thoughts on the indictments? Um, it, it's it's a little interesting just in terms of some of its, you know, when, some of its banality. Actually, I mean, it's it, you know, it 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 spends a lot of time talking about things that are somewhat routine and, and gets to the really heavy stuff. Is it's somewhat lighter. Um, I think maybe that's intentional because it's trying to not reveal um, more of the mm, potential damage. So they're spending all this time laying out the, the factual background relating to the more banal stuff. And then when it comes to the actual interference, it's a little, in my view, a little bit thinner. And I think that might have been a decision to not expose uh, things okay. in a way or to hold their punches for potentially future indictments more related to that. Um, yeah. So, you know, this is, I think, just showing the direction of what where things are going. Uh, further evidence that Russia, um, in at least in view of its, some of its government apparatuses, was directing to gather information and interfere with the U.S. elections. And that, I think, should pose some real issues of how we interact going forward. I'm not sure... You know, if I if I were president of the United States, I'm not actually sure how I would respond to this. I'm not sure what I would do. You know, if I that's yeah. sort of like, what am I supposed to do in response to this information? It's like I don't quite know what the next step is. And and you're talking about Obama, who was president at the time. Well, I'm talking about you and me being president, like right now, dealing with this. It's oh, like, okay. how would you or I, if we are oh, like if we had to deal with the this head person. of state, like okay. how are we supposed to? What are we supposed to do? Like you, you or I are president. Okay. And we have a meeting scheduled with Putin. Yeah. This comes out, it's like, okay, well, now what am I supposed to do? I, I probably still have the meeting with Putin. I don't know that I necessarily do anything directly. Yeah. And, and I'm not trying to defend the way he handled it, but that's what you, what you just said reminded me. Like, what must Obama have been thinking when he found out about all this back then? Because if I understand correctly, you know, a lot of this was known back then in some form, and the president had been briefed, but had not entirely I think known the, I think, how to react. I think the proper react. reaction really here is more internal than external. You know, if I, if I were yeah. if I were able to execute it, my reaction would be let's strengthen our ability to not be hacked versus more uh, versus instead let's take punishments against Russia. My my view would be more like okay, Russia, you got the better of us on this one. You won this round. Uh, let's figure out ways to make sure that you don't win the next round and figure out how to strengthen our internal security. So that'd be probably my reaction to this. Mm -hmm. Fair. I am. Um, I'm. Su I'm super curious what this is leading to because this doesn't. This didn't seem to be a complete document. This seems to. It didn't have loose ends so much as it seemed to have foreshadowing. Yes. And I. I'm. I. I'm not saying I have expectations of what that foreshadowing is going to be, but I'm hoping it's going to be something. Very revealing, because I would just really, really like to have some kind of closure to this very strange chapter of American history. I don't think it's going to end any time in the immediate future. It doesn't seem like it's wrapping up. Yeah, I don't mean changes so much. Like, I'm not trying to say in some roundabout way, like, I hope this gets Trump out of the White House. I, I, I you know, whatever. If, if, that ha if that's supposed to happen, that's supposed to happen. I'm not going to, that's not for me to judge. But... I, I, there's gotta be more here. There should be, I mean, how many Benghazi investigations Lots. were there? There, where, why are we not just as outraged, you know, on the, why is that side of the political fence not just as good outraged question. at all this as they were at Benghazi is what I'm trying to get. Very at. good question. Um, uh, yeah. And now, however, I, I, there's a little bit of my political bias. There were nine Benghazi investigations. So I used the big statistic. I lawyered it. I used the big statistic. But how many millions were spent versus how many millions have been spent on the Mueller investigation? That's a little bit harder to quantify because the Benghazi stuff was mostly U.S. Congress. So I'm not sure how much they spent versus... Right. It was only more. about... It was only several million. I think it was like nine or 20 million or something. But the Mueller spent more than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's... 
Well, it's Mueller's good value for money. 40 some indictments and five guilty pleas and Manafort's mugshot yeah. was posted. It's, it's to the still other. very good value for money. He's no longer allowed it, to have his luxurious jail. The U.S. Allegations. budget is huge. So this is like we're spending nothing on this. It's good value for money. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's... Trillions and trillions of dollars. So, yeah. So, everybody, thanks for joining us. Uh, let's see if I can do it this way. I am Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. And I am Kurt Miller, and... your favorite patent attorney. And I'm not going to do a really long, drawn-out outro like I usually do, because uh, it's Friday night. Everybody go enjoy your Friday night. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you on the Sunday show on Twitch at 10 a.m. Eastern this Sunday, every Sunday, 10 a.m. Twitch on uh, twitch.tv slash Leonard French. Any last I'm words, I'm good. Kurt? It's been wonderful, guys. Later. Peace. All right. Have a good one. Bye.